Well, happy Guru Purab to everyone. Uh, today being uh, Guru Nanak Jayanti and with his teaching of Ek Omkar Satnam. And today we are going to talk about Omkar. So, I mean, somehow it has, you know, synchronized with that. So, hmm. So today we are on Sutra 27. Tasya Vachaka no, recording. Pranava. Recording. What happened? Huh? No. I got it, Kabu. Now just let us uh, uh, go back a little, something which we have talked about before. We'll just repeat. When a student comes on the path, he, as he walks on the path uh, with his teacher or on his own, he passes through different stages. Initially, he finds that uh, his attachments are seducing his attention. So he wants to take his attention inside. He wants to uh, take the attention inside. But something keeps seducing his attention, carrying his attention away, abducting his attention. And it is because of these attachments that he has outside, he finds it very difficult to uh, take the attention inside. So we can say when a student first comes on the path, uh, he comes under what we would call the law of gravity, right? That he wants to fly in the air, but Every time his attention is again seduced by the material world, by the world of relationships. And he keeps falling back on the ground. So gravity keeps pulling him back. And we see that we have attachments. We have physical attachments, that is material attachments uh, in the bhulok, in the physical world. We have attachments in relationship. If my son has an exam tomorrow, my attention will keep going to that point in tomorrow. So we have a, a, what do you call attachments? And we have attachments in thoughts and ideas and conditionings, etc. So every time he makes an effort, he keeps getting pulled back. And so we will call this the law of gravity. Now, over a period of time, he observes his desires, he observes his inclinations, he observes his hungers, and he doesn't tries not to allow them to carry away his attention. He wants to take attention inside. And we had, uh, if you remember, we had uh, said Ishwar Pranidhan, Pra to go forward. Knee to put and dhan to hold. That is to take the attention to the source of attention inside. He observes how his ego gets hurt, his self-love that is. How when people insult him, his attention gets stuck there. How when people laugh at us, our attention gets stuck there. When uh, we are not treated well, then our attention gets stuck there. And so... Uh, he keeps making this effort to free his attention from its attachments. And this, we said before that attention is a property of the soul, which has been abducted, carried away by the machine, the body brain system. It does not belong to the body brain system. It is a property of the soul. And so we have what we call the machine is using the attention of the soul for its own hungers and pursuits. Now, as he takes attention back, things start aligning within him. That is, 
uh, initially we can say in Gurdjieffan language, he had many eyes. So one eye would want to wake up in the morning and do practices, but another eye wants to see a movie till late in the night. And both the eyes would fight, and whichever eye would win, we would either go with the movie or we would go with waking up in the morning. So we have what is called a fragmented attention. And that fragmented attention into many eyes, what Gurdjieff calls. And these eyes rule us. So there is no will of the soul. The will of the machine overpowers the will of the soul. The will of many eyes overpowers the will of the soul. Now, as these eyes start aligning with each other, we observe these eyes and we say, my aim is to rise in consciousness. So I want to wake up in the morning. And so I become free of that eye, which wants to keep me awake at night and watch a movie or serial, etc. And slowly those eyes start dropping and we get inner will, which wants to take us towards our aim on our path. So this aligning of eyes inside, it takes us from the law of gravity into the law of magnetism. Now the student has freed himself from the law of gravity. Here, now it is not easy for the machine to seduce his attention. And he has come under the law of magnetism. I'll just try to, what do you call, explain this in a different way. Science says that Everything has magnetism. But because in the atoms, the north pole of the atom uh, neutralizes the south pole, we don't see that magnetism. So even, a, even plastic will have magnetism, even ceramic will have magnetism, but that magnetism is neutralized. One pole neutralizes the other pole. So one eye, the will of one eye waking up in the morning, the will of the other eye staying awake at night neutralizes the other. Now, supposing we were able to bring all the north to the north and all the south to the south in a piece of plastic, then just like iron exhibits magnetism, plastic would also start exhibiting magnetism. So when all the eyes start within us, they sort of come together that we have one aim and that is to rise in consciousness. There's an inner alignment and the student moves from the law of gravity to the law of magnetism. Now, when we are in the law of magnetism, we see so many changes in our life. And I have talked to so many people over the years and they come to me and they say, suddenly things started changing in our life. And I realized that they are moving from the law. They have made this inner effort. And they are moving from the law of gravity into the law of magnetism. And we would be shocked that events arrange themselves in such a way that we can do our practices. We can make a better effort. Uh, overnight, friends can change. I mean, the old friends could go away and new friends would come who are helping us on our path. And all this, when it starts happening, we see these changes. We realize that we have moved from one law of gravity where we were being pulled back to the earth all the time. We are free of that law. And now we are moving in the law of magnetism. Now, the third and final law in which the student comes is the law of grace. And when he comes to a certain inner circle, he comes within proximity of the divine. When he comes to a certain proximity of the divine, then the divine is pulling him. Suddenly he feels that even if he does nothing, even if he just allows himself to flow, he feels that pull of the divine happening every moment and this pull of the divine is the grace of the divine. But for that, for, for that grace of the divine to come in our lives, we have to come into that shetra, into that uh, magnetic field of the divine, where the divine is pulling us every moment. And it is at that time when suddenly he sees that there's, whether he practices or not, 
whether he does it, everything is happening in some effortless way, as if now the divine is pulling him closer and closer to itself. <clears throat> Now, all these sutras are connected with Ishwar. And in the last sutra, we saw that that Ishwar who is free of time, but when he comes back into time, to play in time, to live an ordinary life in time, even then he is free of the binding of time. We saw this in the last sutra. Now, we have now entered the field of grace over here. And so this next sutra, Tasya Vachaka Pranava, it is talking about the pull which is happening in that field of grace. Now, let us start with the word Pranava. We'll go backwards instead of starting with Vachaka. Tasya means that, that Ishwar. And we can just do a very ordinary, what do you call, uh, translation of a layman which has not referred to the Sanskrit or anything and just say, Tasya means Tenu of that, Tenu in Gujarati, Uska uh, in the Vachak, Vachan, Vachan, his word, his Vachan, his word uh, is Pranava and Pranava is O. Oh. Pranava is over. We are going to go a little deep into this today. So, uh, just an ordinary translation, his vachan, his word, his promise, right, is over. But we will start with the word pranava. Now, the meaning, the definition of the word pranava, prakashena nuyate. And within this, we have the word akarshan, to pull, to attract. Can you see now we are in the field where the divine is attracting us. When we started our journey, we were in the field where the earth was pulling us back, where the material pursuits of life were pulling us back. right? And now we've come into the field where the divine is pulling us. Prakashena new year thing. Now, now in this Pra, pra means to go forward. Pra, akrush. Krush, the word Krishna comes from the word krush, means to attract. To attract to such an extent that even light gets attracted and cannot come out. Hmm? So that powerful attraction. So to go forward in that attraction, praka, uh, to go forward in that attraction, prakashena, nuyate. Nuyate, right? Now, we saw in the last sutra that he is untouched by time. So, even if he is going forward, that pull is bringing him forward. He, every moment is new, new, new. It is nuyate. It is every moment is new for him. It is See, when we say the mantra Om, we are repeating the mantra, but every mantra is new. Every uh, time we are saying, if it is not new, then it is not Om. So, uh, Pranav means pra to go forward, right? Uh, the pr pr prakash, uh, be attracted to be pulled forward, and we keep going forward, and it is Nu. Now, Nu also means to praise. To praise. So, to praise because it is new. <clears throat> to praise because it is fresh. I'll try to explain this in a certain way. Praise not in the meaning of this way, but praise in the sense of wah wah, you know, astonishment, wah wah, where we say. So, supposing we have gone for a sitar recital and the artist is playing the sitar. And at a certain point, at a certain point, the artist goes into some intricate, uh, what do you call, notes, overtones, harmonics, sur. He goes into some, and 
automatically we say wow wow you know uh, we are enjoying the music so much that we automatically say wow wow and the uh, artist acknowledges and he says adab he says now adab is not just thank you he is acknowledging us he is saying i understand uh, i am so happy that you and i are on the same frequency i played this one uh, what do you call uh, uh, note i played this special note you heard that note and you said wah wah you said that you praised me as wah wah and in that there is an acknowledgement where he says adab yes i understand you and i are at the same frequency you have grasped what i am playing now we will see at that stage where we are saying om there is a grasping of the meaning of om if you see in the sutra there is a realization of the meaning there's a grasping of the fear meaning of om and there is a kind of acknowledgement we get a kind of acknowledge hey, you have grasped it you got it so and and when that happens continuously every moment is new when it is happening because it is happening in that timelessness so nothing is old over there uh, it is it is happening continuously every moment is new it becomes prakash and nuyate that is the meaning of the word pranava right and pranava is symbolized as om and we'll go into it a uh, little later what it means now we'll just go into the words prakash and to pull towards self continuously <clears throat> and because he is pulling to a self in that freedom of time there is this freshness where he is praising nu nuyate now if we just take again the ordinary meaning of the word prana just to a layman who does not understand sanskrit or anything right pra to go forward now it is now what we call in gujarati now new all the time to keep going forward and it is new all the time just an ordinary meaning if you take so what patanjali is saying over here that you are now in that uh, field of the divine ishwara and by repeating this mantra om by saying this mantra om you are being pulled closer and closer into that divine emptiness uh, which uh, where everything dissolves into that one thing so he's saying something like this now because it is new every moment we cannot say it is a repetition i am not repeating the old, but in a way i am repeating and we'll come to that later on it is a reverberation i'm reverberating the word om i'm saying it <clears throat> there is a resonance now by teacher uh, tavarya saheb he used to say that the human structure the human conditioning which man is in uh it it is so powerful it is more powerful than a thick iron plate it is more powerful than a thick iron plate and it takes years of hard work to break free from our attitudes our habits our different conditionings our so or the contradictions we have inside that is as we observe them we break free of them it is only then that this iron structure changes that it what gurjev calls we change our level of being now when we are doing mantra when we are doing mantra we are trying to create a sound which crumbles that iron structure that uh, what do you call which breaks that iron structure in which we have been conditioned for thousands of years i don't know if i'm coming across it now sound itself cannot break that structure it is the resonance the reverberations of the sound which we create uh, that go to break that structure 
uh, we can say this in another way that in the Second World War, uh, the British were throwing a lot of bombs on the German dams. And the dams were not breaking. And uh, they were really puzzled that we are throwing so many bombs on the uh, dams. And these dams are not breaking. So one scientist was uh, studying this uh, phenomenon. And he, was, he had this habit of taking a bath in his bathtub with all kinds of small boats and toys around him. And he would play with them when uh, taking this bath. And he, you know, pushed the water at one end of the tub, but the boat at the other end of the tub, it jumped up like this. And suddenly he says, I got it. Like uh, Archimedes said, Eureka, he said, I got it. And he ran to his laboratory, did all the calculations. And the next day he presented it to the war office that the mistake we are making is we are throwing the bombs on the dams. We have to throw the bombs in the water far away from the dams. Force of the water created will break the dam. Similarly, when we are doing mantra, the mantra is not going to break the dam. The old structure, our sanskars, our conditioning is not going to be broken by the... It is the reverberations of the mantra, the resonance of the mantra, which is going to break the condition. And that is why it becomes more important to create that. So it is not a rep repetition. It is a kind of a resonance which we are creating, a reverberation which we are creating. Now we'll go to the beginning of the sutra, Tasya Vachaka. Vachak uh, comes uh, from vach to say, but not just to say, to say and to comprehend at the same time, to say and to grasp at the same time. That is, if I just say om, 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 it is not prana. But if I say om and in that moment I grasp the meaning, I comprehend the experience, then it is O, then it is Pranav, otherwise it is not Pranav, then I'm just saying anything. So uh, there is not just the saying, Vachakaha, it means that I'm saying it, but I'm also comprehending it, grasping it at the same time. So when we say the word Om, we get this inner experience of being pulled into Ishwar Every moment and every moment it is new, and we keep on saying this va va. So, tasya vachakaha pranav. Now, let us go deeper into the word vachakaha. The definition of the word is vakti, abhida vruttaya, bodhayati, arthan. Vakti, you put the words there. Vakti to speak, to denote, to signify. Vakti. Vrutti. The vrutti which has been held. The vrutti dharan. Abhidha. Dha means dharan. Abhi means towards. Uh, vruttaya. Dha vruttaya. Means the vrutti which has been held in the mind. The vritti which has been held in the mind. Here we we'll take the meaning of the word vritti as behavior, as pattern, something which goes on repeating, going round and round. So, say so, so what? Now we did the meaning of the word dha when we did Ishwar Pranidhanam. The meaning of the word dha to collect attention take it back at the source and do not allow it to be seduced again. That is to hold it there. That is the meaning of the word dha. Right? So abhida, to, work, to collect that attention, put it there and move towards that inner pull. Right? So that vritti, that pattern, that new habit, that new behavior, which we 
create that is we keep on repeating the word om and we are keep on getting pulled inside that is called abhida vritti now what kind of behavior what kind of vritti that vritti which provokes the knowing of ishwara that vritti which becomes a cause for the knowing of ishwara now just we'll try to understand this that i say i can't pay my bills so i have a vritti that i don't have any money right so now this vritti may become a cause may become a cause for me tomorrow to make effort to earn some money can can you understand so the vritti which we are holding in the mind that i want to reach there to that ishwara and for that i am saying this om that is that abhida vritti which is taking me over there <clears throat> now abhida also means in the sense of naming in the sense of naming so supposing uh we have a map on the table and i say you have to go to this place so now if i go to this place then i have to name that place i have to name that place right so i name that place as pranava oh i name that place as pranava this is the place you have to go to how do you go to that place huh so the inner desire to go to that place is abhida vritti right but how do you go to that place by collecting your attention and filling it up inside giving it back to the soul inside that is how you do it but i come back after some time and i say you have uh what do you call gone on some diversion somewhere else you're not moving towards that place which i'd shown you on the map huh? you have got stuck somewhere else so maybe i see you're stuck in getting insulted somewhere or you're stuck in some other fulfilling some other desires of life and i say that this was what we had decided that you will go there but your attention has again got attracted somewhere else and you're stuck over there so i say uh please again bring that vritti back in the mind bring that thought back in the mind that you want to reach to that point which is called as prana so that vritti when you hold it in the mind dharan abhida dharan when you hold it in the mind it is that which becomes the cause which keeps on make allowing you to make effort to reach that point which we call as prana so that is why it is in the sense of naming Naming tasya vachaka prana in the sense of naming. So abhida vrutteya is the continuous and repetitive behavior that I want to go there towards Ishvara, and at times we forget. because that we are not holding that thought in the mind that desire in the mind that wish in the mind that i want to go there okay. now what is the behavior what is the vritti telling what behavior it is saying by repeating the word om i am going to go over there but not just repeating like i said there is a repeating and then there is a grasping and experiencing at the same time so now we'll go back to that uh the meaning of uh, vakti to say abhida vrutay bodhayati arthan there is bodh of the artha artha desire the wish the aim Uh, there is both of the earth so by naming by saying the word om i am moving towards the grasping both grasping the comprehending 
of the aim the artha which is the pranav the, the ishvara so pranav is the symbol om which by repeating by speaking by resounding maybe even just by seeing if it is done in the right way abhidha vrutaya then there is both grasping of our aim to reach to that ishvara and it is not a repetition it is va va new every time so the meaning of the word artha over here arthang will be to experience it to comprehend it to grasp it so teno vachak pranav teno te you know vachak pranav tasya vachak pranav that is by saying the om by saying pranav we experience that state of ishvara now another root instead of we we took the root as pra and nu pra mean to go forward and nu mean new all the time we can also take a root of just pranu take both the words together and that would again mean to resound to reverberate but let us try to go what the uh, into a deeper meaning over here of pranu now in this mantra of om the omkar is being said somewhere and we are only repeating it we are only resounding it we are only reverberating it so there is a movement of consciousness from where we are repeating or resounding it to its origin its source of where it is being said right so i mean whenever we say the mantra om we may uh feel that we are saying it i am saying it but i am only resounding it i am not saying it it has already been said somewhere else and i am just resounding saying it uh, again and this is something which is quite dif- difficult to understand so there is some point in space time somewhere within deep down within me in the inner emptiness where that mantra is being continuously said tell him i'm in a lecture you must be having some lecture. where the mantra is being completely uh, co- continuously said and we want to reach to that space where it is being said so we stay from here to reach to that space and that space is ishwara now uh, we'll go back to our last talk which we took last tuesday we call the supreme consciousness as the shiv as the never changing aspect and shakti as the ch- ever changing aspect of that consciousness and we uh talked about how shiv and shakti over different stages separated and at one point shakti took the sword of kala because the sutra was on kala so the sword of, and she separated herself from shiva and the what the, the dichotomy the, the dualism of the universe was created right <clears throat> we talked about this last time now we can also call the shiv aspect as chitta and the shakti aspect as prakruti so prakruti evolves out of consciousness out of chitta and when the sword of time cuts the two it is the first movement in this unchanging consciousness there is a movement from where everything is whole and one into the many this first movement 
it is in, in the Indian Shastra, especially in Kashmir Shaivism, it is called as Spanda. And they have a Shastra called the Spanda Karika. So that first movement is called Spanda. And the sound of that first movement, the sound which emanates, the orchestra which emanates from that first movement was approximated as Om. It was named as Om. It is not Om. It was the sound of that movement. and But it was approximated as Om. So, the movement of separation from the one to the many, it created this sound and we name that sound as Om or Pranav. Tasya Vachaka Pranav. I name you as Pranav. Now, in that moment, when Om was created, Prakruti created the dichotomy of life, the dualism of life, subject and object. Subject being mind, right, and object being matter or artha. So we have, so we come to this uh, definition of uh, what do you call vachaka uh, as uh, vakti abhidaya vruttiya bodhayati arthami artha. So we have the word artha over here, right? Hmm. So we see this. Division into two as subject and object. And there are three things which come here. The subject grasps the object. It comprehends the object. The mind comprehends the object. Now, try to understand this. Uh, I'll just talk a little over here. The mind which we are talking about is the universal mind. But when the Object comes into the, it comes into the, what do you call, uh, comes in front of the mind, is seen in front of the mind. That universal mind has to modify itself to accommodate the subject, the object. I just, right? So, supposing this is the object then my mind has to take the shape of this object for me to realize this object. Similarly, that universal mind in that first movement of Spanda, we saw that two things were created, the subject and the object, right? And for the subject, which is the mind, to have comprehension of the object, it has to modify itself. This first modification of the mind to what do you call allow the itself to understand the object to see to uh, what do you call have pratye what they call pratye have the comprehension of the object is what is called vritti and that is why in yoga we say yoga chitta vritti nirod if we can stop that vritti then it no longer remains as individual mind it becomes universal that can, can you understand it becomes the individual mind to accommodate the object to accommodate what it is seeing in front of it. So, the, the mind is apprehending the object, seeing the object, comprehending the object. The object is artha. The mind is ob comprehending that is called pratyay. But still, there is no movement from comprehension to understanding. And this movement from comprehension to understanding, this movement from grasping something to understanding, can only come about when the mind names that object. It gives a name to that object. Then the mind says, well, so I tell you, what is this? This is a flower or this is a box. Aha, I have understood what you're saying, right? But if this has no name, how will you understand? So in that moment, when that first movement came and the mind divided into subject and object where there was a grasping of that sound, there was a, what do you call, uh, what you call comprehension of that sound by that universal mind, it named it as, because otherwise there would be no understanding, so it named it as Pranav, it named it as Omkar, but it was just a sound, and this is the name given there for us to understand, that is how the mind understands, Tasya Vachaka Pranav.
So we see that what is in front of the mind is pure vibration. It is not really an object. But when the mind accommodates that pure vibration, it the well, that vibration becomes artha or the object, and the mind becomes pratye. It becomes the comprehension of the object, and then comes the shabda, the naming of that object. So there is understanding, and so there was the naming of that original sound as omkar. In the supreme consciousness, shabda, artha, and pratye are connected. They become one. They they are not separate. But in man, they are separate, but they are also connected with each other. Now, if we take science, then science will tell us that this universe came out of the Big Bang. And that Big Bang maybe happened so many billion years ago or some point of in the past in time. But Shastra does not say this. The Indian Shastra does not say this. They say that that Big Bang is happening every moment. It is never in the past. It is always in the now. I hope I'm coming across in this. So that Omkar, it is not something which happened in the past. It is not that Shiva and Shakti separated or Chitta and Prakruti separated uh, in somewhere in the past. It is happening every moment. So that Omkar is being resounded every moment. So we say, Bodhayati Arthan, there is a grasping, there is a comprehending, there is an understanding, knowing of the Artha. That Artha is the sound of Omkar, and there is a grasping of that sound. The person who hears this divine orchestra, right, he, there's a grasping of that sound, and he says, Va, va. He cannot help it but say, Va, va. And in the reverberation of that sound, that Omkar tells him, you have got it, you have grasped it. And this, because it happens continuously, and this happens as he keeps repeating the Omkar till he reaches that state where that Omkar is manifesting and where he is repeating, there's that movement from here, and that is the movement, the pulling of Ishwara. So we saw Vakti, to name, he names that sound as Pranav, Omka. How did he reach there? By holding a Vritti in the mind that he wants to reach there. Right? And what was the behavior which came out of that Vritti? The repeating of the word Om, which took him, which pulled him inside and took him over there. Tasya Vachaka Pranav. And it is the understanding, the comprehending of that first cosmic movement. He sees it, he understands it, and each moment he grasps it, each moment he names it as Omka. It is not in the past tense, it is happening every moment. So we say the student first creates an attitude in the mind, that he wants to reach there, where there, Ishwara. For that, he repeats Omkar. But it is not just the repeating, there's the grasping and realization of its meaning with each repetition, which is new all the time. It is not a repetition. And when he reaches there, he says, Are, I, have, I have been saying the mantra all this time, but the mantra was already manifesting over there. Right? I'm not supposed to say the mantra. I now hear the mantra and I name the mantra. And there is no longer any need to say the mantra. That saying took him from where he was repeating it. So when we say the mantra, Om, we are only repeating what is being said somewhere else. And it is there, that point which we want to reach, which we say there. So he hears the sound for the first time. He cannot help but praising it, saying, Va, va. It is as if the Veena of Saraswati is playing there all the time. He comes there and he hears it. He says, Va, Va, and he names it as Om, Pranav. Tasya, Vachaka, Pranav. We'll go to the next sutra.
तद जप तब तद अर्थ भावनम द रेपिटेशन ऑफ दैट ओम ब्रिंग्स अ रियलाइजेशन ऑफ इट्स मीनिंग Tauria Sahib says, through the sounding of the word and through reflection upon its meaning, the way is found. Tad japa ha, tad artha bhavnam. Artha bhavnam. What it means? I'll just change this translation a little over here. We'll just change this translation over here. That is artha bhavanam is the driving force for japa, for japa, or artha, or the desire, or the wish, or the motive for realization of that Ishwar and its meaning is the driving force for our japa of omka, right? It is the causal, the uh, what do you call efficient cause. For us to do the Om, I'm just changing the meaning a little from the meanings which we have taken. Now we can take uh, another, uh, what do you call, translation of Mr. Tawaria when he says that the when the object to be gained, earth object to be gained, earth is sufficiently valued. Sufficiently bhavanam, sufficiently valued bhavanam. When there is artha bhavanam, the artha bhavanam, when it is sufficiently valued, then it becomes the cause for efforts towards its attainment. That becomes the cause for efforts towards its attainment. And what are the efforts? Japa, repeating the name, uttering the name, right? But not just uttering, like we said. Now we'll go into the word japa and the word bhavanam. Now, in life, the cause could be anything, right? So. A cause could be I've fallen in love with a beautiful girl, right? So that is the I want to realize the earth of bhavanam of having a beautiful girl, and so I'm doing japa of our all 24 hours, right? So uh, we can say it in that way, uh, or uh, I can say I'm sick and I'm ill and I want to become healthy. So there is a in the mind there is an earth of bhavanam object to be attained. Artha bhavanam of what do you call getting healthy, and so I take medicines and I take tonics and etc. etc. <clears throat> so the wish, the desire, the inner desire to attain that state that becomes the cause, the driving force for japa, uh, the driving force for japa. Now, some scholars they say tad japa tad artha bhavanam. They say in place of uh, tad, you can use the word tasya. So it could become tasya tasya bhavanam. Tenu of it of whom of that Ishwar or that pra, of of that prano. What right that is that. Uh, the realization of the aim of that Om and the experience of it is the driving force. That yeah? is the is what you call Japa. It leads to Japa. Now, in life, there are two kinds of arthas. Artha means aim, meaning, object, etc. Relative artha and param artha. Paramatma, we say param artha. Paramatma, the, the uh, divine wholeness is the param artha. Now, I am sick, I want to get healthy is a relative artha. Can, can you get related to 
what do you call i am sick i want to be healthy artha bhavanam tad japa tad artha bhavanam this artha bhavanam is in my mind i want to be healthy or uh, we could say anything else that i want to what do you call pass in an exam so i have that artha bhavanam so i study for the exam so uh, but these are all relative arthas and in life from morning to evening different relative arthas come in front of us to live this game of life we have relative arthas relative uh, desires objects wishes which come to meet us but the desire for ishwar the desire to reach that state of ishwar that wish that is param artha it is not just an ordinary artha that is why it is called param artha parmartha <clears throat> relative arthas keep on changing in life right when i am young i may have one relative artha but as i grow old the rel- different arthas may change but the param artha does not change it is always the same now we'll go into the word japa to japa vyaktayam vyaktayam vachi bhave ap that is to mutter to whisper to repeat but in expressing there is an expressing that is vachi to speak but in vyakta to express it also many times we meet people in life who have understood something right uh, there is vachi in their life they can but they cannot express it they cannot put it into words properly so they don't have vyakta yam they don't have vyakta yam right so when there is vachi that is you can speak but in that speaking you can also express you can manifest what you are talking about so the person who is listening to you in his mind there comes a picture of what you are talking about there comes an understanding a grasping of what you are talking about right so japa is not just the repetition the utterance right and the utterance is soft it is not loud it is soft right so but there is a kind of mani- when we do the japa when we do the repetition there is a kind of vyaktayam a manifestation in the mind of what the japa we are doing right so you can see the realization of its what you call meaning or experience there is a kind of experiencing in the mind of that omkar which i am repeating so each time it is new and i express and i understand the meaning within from the word uh, vyaktaya we can get the word vyaktikaran to manifest uh, it has become visible on the plane of the senses now artha we saw as the efficient word and bhav bhavanam that is to effect and to provoke for effecting so that bhavanam that inner state it becomes the provocation for the behavior which is the japa now now the word artha literally translates as meaning sense goal purpose essence etc but in this sense over here it is used in the sense of asking now in the mahabharat we have one word called arjun so 
the meaning there are many meanings of the word arjun but one of the j arji kare che the one who is asking the one who is asking so he is doing a yachna what we call he is doing a kind of prayer to the guru you please give me the knowledge that is why arjun is the disciple the sishya the one who is asking from the guru he is uh, what do you call uh, doing a prayer a yachna to the guru that you please give to me right so arth can have a meaning of to make an effort to go and to obtain and get it that can also be one and the other way you get it but you don't get it by going and obtaining it you get it by praying for it by uh, uh, doing a yachna for it by doing a kind of asking for it arji for it so in that is the sense in which the word arth Japatad earth is used over here. We don't go and we get that earth. We say the mantra Om by saying the mantra Om. We are taken closer and closer towards that earth. But in the sense that we are praying for it, we are asking for it, we are worshiping for it. Not in the sense that we go and get it. We entreat for it. So earth the. Artha dhato vaya would be artha yate, making that yachna, making that effort, the entreatment for it. So the meaning of the word japa, uttering and manifesting in the mind, that artha, the meaning on or the object to be gained, which we are asking for, and because it is bhavanam, uh, uh, it is uh, what do you call? It colors the mind. It becomes the bhav in the mind. It becomes the driving force. For us to say Om, and as we say Om, we keep on getting pulled into that Om, that point where the Omkar is already being said. At one point, the Omkar will drop what we are saying, and we will be hearing that original Omkar, which is fresh, new, every moment. It is that cosmic, what do you call, orchestra, which is saying it, and we will be just as the first person named it. We will be naming it Tasya Vachaka Paranava Tad Artha Tad Japa Tad Artha Bhavana. So the desired object of attaining that state became the driving force, the Bhavana, the driving force for us to say the Japa to reach there. I'll stop over here. Right? I hope I've been able to come across uh, in these two sutras. Any questions, please do it. Yeah. Somebody raised the hand. It's come away. What is it? Ah, uh, hello, sir. Ah, uh, namaste, namaste. How are namaste. you? I'm fine, sir. So I have first time I'm attending this. It's the second session of yours. So basically, I'm asking this intellectual question. I am. I'm, I didn't get. Don't ask anything. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Don't worry. Um, I mean, Patanjali. I have not read before uh, the sutras. Uh, I have started uh, listening to your uh, talks. Uh, what I read is uh, he has divided the uh, Patanjali sutras like in in chapter wise, like samadhi pada, sadhana pada, in that terms. So, what are you talking? These are in terms of chapters, or how it has been divided, or how you are taking us to uh, through this journey. I just wanted to understand. Okay, okay, I'll try and tell you. <laughs> uh, you know, it is this body-brain system uh, which we have to use. To achieve a certain goal, supposing we call that goal as Ishwar, which we have been talking about in the past, sutras, right? So the whole Yoga Sutra is what takes us towards that Ishwara, and what are the obstacles when we go towards that Ishwara, and what takes us away from that Ishwara, and how to be free of that? Can you get what I'm trying to say? So, this, the final state he does not call as Ishwara; he calls as Kaivalya. Kaivalya means uh, oneness, aloneness, unity. Right? Now, 
Uh, so Patanjali has divided the thing into four books, four chapters. Huh? Sadhan, what do you call the first is the Samadhi Pada, right? So mm-hmm. where he explains all the Samadhis, right? So we are now, we have gone through some of the Samadhis, Vitarka, Vichar, we went through all those Samadhis. Now we have come to Tasya Vachaka Pranava, where we are naming the Ishwar, the controlling factor is, right? And he will let, but here he also says that in this Samadhi, the seed of knowing remains. Tatra Nirati Shayam uh, Sarvagna Bijam, the Bij remains. Now later on, he's going to talk of other Samadhis, which are free of the Bij. Can you get what I'm trying to say? So, in the whole first chapter, he is explaining the whole map. The whole map. Right? Then in the second chapter, he is sadhanpad. Means what techniques you can use to go forward in that map in your journey. Right? The third is vibhutipad. When you go on the journey, what scenery will come on the way? Okay. And the fire final is Kaivalyapad. When you enter into that absolute oneness, uh, what are the stages you pass through? Right? So he has divided it into four chapters. My teacher, Mr. Tauriya, divided it into five chapters, and you can uh, five chapters, and you can say six also because five he has divided into one and two. You understand? So now supposing. We've been taking from Sutra 21, now it is 28, seven sutras on Ishwara, right? So Mm. three he has taken in one book, but these last two he has taken right in Kevalya, in the fifth, this thing. Now, it is very difficult because when you say Tasya Vachaka Pranava, Tasya means of that Ishwara, but of that Ishwara is not there because he has divided them and put them into book five. But then what he is talking about, these are such high states. When you are being pulled into that Ishwara, that it will come at that time. He's talking about experientially what you pass through. But Patanjali has uh, divided it into four books, and these are the four books, right? What is the map? What are the techniques? What is the scenery? And how comes the ultimate dissolution, right? So he has divided it into four books. I don't know if have I been able to express it. Right? Yeah, I have one more question, sir. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, whatever Patanjali is saying, or uh, Tavarajya Sarji is saying, so to reach that, we have to go inward in terms of attention, as you mentioned, that, uh, the main essence of the soul. So, every day when the I... The soul has uh, three properties, consciousness, uh-huh. attention and will. It has three properties. Okay. These are three primary properties. Right? Okay. It is when attention flows through the body-brain system we are living. You see, my eyes are looking at you, but if attention is not flowing out of my eyes, I cannot see you. I may be looking at you, but if I'm daydreaming, there's no attention flowing out of my eyes. I don't know who is in front of me. You you get it? Whatever. So, uh, attention has to flow out of the sense organs, and that attention is the property of the soul. It belongs to the soul. But it has been abducted, what do you call, uh, brain carried body. away, seduced okay. by the body-brain system, which Gurdjieff calls the machine. Right? So attention, which was the property of the soul, has been taken over by the machine. Now our effort is to take it back from the machine. It goes back to the soul. When it goes back to the soul, at one point, the machine is just now controlling the soul. The soul starts controlling the machine, the body-brain and that is the point of Ishwar, the controller, okay, right? the one who controls. Mm-mm. Yes. So, uh, in terms of refining exercises, I could uh, literally like see the differences. Uh, you know where my attention is going. But certain situations at home, at with the people, uh, seeing the likes and dislikes within me, it like whole sis- body system goes like havoc. Uh, when I do refining excess, it's it's fine. But the moment if somebody, you know, raise something, which is against, I, I try to look in, but it takes a lot of time to okay come to that. Okay, I was looking into something which is not, uh, which is my pattern within me or conditioning. But the whole day will go off. 
so uh, here my question is i have i've been doing uh, refining exercises from past two months um, and before that i was doing some other practices like kind of uh, yoga asanas and all but there is a lot of difference when i was doing hatha yoga and the refining exercises there is a lot of difference it's such a such a coolness in my body happens when when i see observing the things comparing with people i mean when i with people it's very difficult uh, situation is happening i i don't know how to handle such things uh, but when i try to to be attentive try to be observe uh, the whole body system goes have a sir so uh, could you please suggest something See, when we observe the idea is not to judge to observe impartial so even if we are observing order we are observing and if we are order if we are observing chaos also we are observing okay. the thing is that the whole body brain system goes berserk and we get identified with it then we are not observing we are just mm. aware of it can you can you understand so yes, the idea is to to observe don't worry about what you are observing right okay just observe just observe it is that person who is observing who is important hmm. the subject the subjective uh, experience of observe, observing which is important hmm? so don't uh, this thing and uh, you see all these conditionings have come over thousands of years we in one night we are not going to be free of <laughs> yeah i yes sir time. even to get a ba degree takes 20 years <laughs> so uh, uh, this is going to take time no worry uh, but keep practicing i'm very happy that you are observing and making this effort it's really really good that you are doing this it's uh, i must congratulate you on that yeah. thank you sir. thank you no more questions any on the net no oh there are no more questions hey uh, mamen rajan bhai can i say something please please sir please enlighten us sir uh, <laughs> no it's not about just something that i went through uh, during the day today i i was watching something on youtube and there was a gentleman who showed an experiment that putting two tuning forks at a little distance apart he played one for some time and then he put his hand on it so this tuning fork stopped but the other tuning fork which was vibrating due to resonance is it started emitting its own sound right right it really gels with what you said about the mantra mm. that it is not the words that really bring about the purification or the understanding it is the resonance Mm-hmm. that we are the experts sir i can see all this at the back in the background <laughs> no, no, no. i'll tell you a small incident sir huh. which was shared to me by with me by vimla ji i huh. know if you have you heard of vimla thakur ha huh, vimla thakur i have yes yeah. so we were sitting and talking one day and she was saying that she had gone to meet pandit omkarna thakur oh the great musician musician and they said they on the wall there were seven tanpuras on the wall uh, leaning against the wall and omkarna ji started playing the tanpura and one by one all the seven start started uh, resounding and said this phenomenon i have seen with my own eyes she was telling me i mean this was resonance this was resonance and <laughs> uh good evening rajan sir yes yes yeah okay i just wanted to share one thing uh, recently a few days ago my son sent me a video uh, on a black hole 
so it was like some research like scientists they wanted to uh, they had taken out some sound from the black hole uh, what that was but it was it was not audible so they amplified the sound of the black hole and he just uh, my son sent me to just listen to it and when i listened to the sound it uh, resonated perfectly like we do omkar and i was i just got so connected with that sound uh, somehow i when i used to do omkar uh, that connection which after hearing th- that video that became all the more more powerful after hearing that video i got so connected like that cosmic sound it it's just made a such a difference on me uh, that my om kar practice has uh, really <laughs> yeah so i was amazed to an extent like how that cosmic is giving the same sound that was that really left an impact and every time now i do the omkar practice i just connect with that <laughs> you know when we were doing this uh, sutra with mr tawaria our said and then he says everything is omkar and so then i was so fortunate he says rajan is omkar tawaria is own car and we are both one <laughs> so i have it on tape also i mean i have this thing yeah he is saying rajan is own car tawaria is own car and we are both one and then he repeated we are both one three times <laughs> so you know everything every word is own car every word is own car right everything has come out of that that is the first movement of that where nothing was changing nothing was moving yeah. so <clears throat> when you were explaining all this i could connect it so well with that right. that that omkar is already from some source and we are just resonating it yeah. thank you so much actually samar ji jab ji sahab offers very beautiful insights yes sir omkar who offers jab ji sahab guru nanak devs Oh, first uh, side. Hmm. Well, no other questions. So we'll continue next week, Hema Ji. Ji sir. Right next. So people first. are uh, asking in the chat box about the lunar eclipse. What to do? <laughs> Any. insight you would like to share <sighs> see on the whole eclipses have a more mass effect than a individual effect so it there is a mass thinking or we would uh, put it in the sense of crowd psychology so it becomes very important at that time if we can sit in meditation or we can do some mantra or something because the effects on the mass please don't understand mass as in just the crowd of people or all the people or something like that sir now supposing i am watching a cricket match right and uh, nay i'll just I'll first take it in another way that supposing i get angry on you then i'm sowing the seed of anger right i'm sowing the seed of anger and wherever that seed goes whatever comes out of it it's a different matter so that is one seed of anger which i have sown by getting angry on you i'm watching the cricket match and at that moment i am not a person when i'm watching the cricket match i'm a crowd can you understand what i'm trying to say right so my favorite batsman gets out and 
it's not I getting angry. It is one lakh people getting angry at the same time. You understand what I'm trying to say? So I'm not sowing the potency of one seed of anger, which I got. I'm sowing the potency of so many lakh seeds of anger. Can you understand what I'm trying to say? Similarly, the past is called the shadow. The sanskar is called the shadow. It is the, the shadow which falls upon the divine. So it is the shadow which falls upon the light. The shadow which falls. And that is a very good moment to work on self because we are not working with one seed. Can you see we are working with mass seed? It is that one lakh seeds which I've sown at that moment of getting angry in the cricket match. Suddenly I'm free of that altogether because I'm working in the shadow. I don't know if I'm able to come across in this, right? So the effect of the eclipse is a mass effect. Mass in the sense it may have a, what I call, effect on the world stage. That is, we are not talking of mass in that sense. We are talking as we as a part of the mass that when we become a part of crowd psychology, it is that moment where we, by just doing one, even one mala of Gayatri, one japa, we can be free of so much of potency, inner potency at one time, as if we are being free of the mass at that time. And that is why it is very important to at least sit for 20 minutes or half an hour in silence or do a mala of Gayatri or something. Or you can even do the Om Kar while the eclipse is going on. Because it has this high potency effect of clearing sanskha, clearing the shadow. That is. Was it clear? Thank you, sir. Clear? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Very much clear. <laughs> yeah. Both are shadows. Eh? Of course, we've had a solar eclipse 15 days ago. Right? And we are now having the lunar eclipse. And these, when two eclipses come so close to each other, sometimes it's the best period for inner work. It is as if the cosmic vibrations are just helping you to go inside. Of course, it's also the best period to get angry on somebody or beat it. It's <laughs> <laughs> but it's the best period for your inner work because these two eclipses have sort of uh, come very close to each other. <laughs> One of uh, Mr. Taurya's sayings is that somebody asked him a question uh, that how do I know when I'm enlightened? So he says that, can you see the sun? It's coming through the window, the rays of the sun. This is when the rays of the sun fall upon you and you don't have any shadow, then you know that you're enlightened. Now, he definitely, if the rays of the sun fall on me, there's going to be a shadow. He's talking about something much deeper. What I'm trying to say is that in the shadow, we want, we can be free of the shadow. And to be free of the shadow is to be free of that which is covering light. Yeah? <clears throat> Shall we? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Shall we stop? Jesus. Or Jesus. Else? Right? God, sir. Sir, would you like to? Gorji. Gorji. Uh, uh, yes, Emma. You could close for us. Okay. So we'll. Uh, so it's it's a time of healing. So maybe I will do eleven times the Dhanvantari mantra if it is all right, Rajan Bhai. Please do, please do, sir. Okay. Om Namo Bhagavate. वासुदेवाय धन्वंतरय अमृत कलशहस्ताय सर्वामय विनाशनाय
त्रैलोक्यनाथाय श्री महाविष्णुवे नमः ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय धन्वंतर अमृतकलशहस्ताय सर्वामय विनाशनाय त्रैलोक्यनाथाय श्री महाविष्णुवे नमः ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय धन्वंतर अमृतकलशहस्ताय सर्वामय विनाशनाय त्रैलोक्यनाथाय श्री महाविष्णुवे नमः ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय धन्वंतर अमृतकलशहस्ताय सर्वामय विनाशनाय त्रैलोक्यनाथाय श्री महाविष्णुवे नमः ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय धन्वंतर अमृतकलशहस्ताय सर्वामय विनाशनाय त्रैलोक्यनाथाय श्री महाविष्णुवे नमः ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय धन्वंतर अमृतकलशहस्ताय सर्वामय विनाशनाय त्रैलोक्यनाथाय श्री महाविष्णुवे नमः ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय धन्वंतर अमृतकलशहस्ताय सर्वामय विनाशनाय त्रैलोक्यनाथाय श्री महाविष्णुवे नमः ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय धन्वंतर अमृतकलशहस्ताय सर्वामय विनाशनाय त्रैलोक्यनाथाय श्री महाविष्णुवे नमः ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय धन्वंतर अमृतकलशहस्ताय सर्वामय विनाशनाय त्रैलोक्यनाथाय श्री महाविष्णुवे नमः ओ नमो 
भगवते वासुदेवाय धन्वंतर अमृत कलशहस्ताय सर्वामय विनाशनाय त्रैलोक्यनाथाय श्री महाविष्णवे नमः ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय धन्वंतर अमृत कलशहस्ताय सर्वामय विनाशनाय त्रैलोक्यनाथाय श्री महाविष्णवे नमः We send out the vibrations of the mantra to the universe and let us end with the Shanti part. Sarvesham Swastir Bhavatu Sarvesham Shantir Bhavatu Sarvesham Puranam Bhavatu Sarvesham Mangalam Bhavatu Sarve Bhavan तु सुखिनो सर्वे संतु निरामयाह सर्वे भद्राणि पश्यन्तु मा कश्चिद दुख भाग भवे ओ Shanti, Shanti, Shanti.